Yeah. Good evening. And uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. My name is Bob Pretty. I'm a member of the board of the Friends of the State Archives. We're always glad to see a good crowd on Thursday evenings like this. Uh, before we get started on tonight's program, I'd like to uh, say a couple of things about what's coming up, and, uh, and especially next month. Uh, next month we're going to be featuring, and they turned out the lights on me, so pardon me while I <laughs> look a little more closely at the script. Uh, next month we're going to be doing a, a presentation by uh, John Rickman and, oh thank you very much, <laughs> by John Rickman and Kim Todd. They're going to be speaking about uh, their new book, and it's a fascinating story of a woman who was involved in some of the very first really high-tech stuff and the development of it in America. The book is called Pioneer Programmer, Gene Jennings Bartik, and the Computer That Changed the World. Now, it looks to me like this audience is probably old enough to remember something called ENIAC. Right. Well, she was very much involved with the development of ENIAC. In early 1945, the United States military was recruiting female mathematicians to work on a secret project that would help out World War II. Uh, Betty Jean Jennings, who later became Betty Jean Jennings Bartik, was an adventurous 20-year-old college student from Northwest Missouri when she was recruited by the Army. She was a college graduate who applied for the job, and she was hired as a human computer. She was able to calculate things very quickly. She calculated artillery shell trajectories, for example. She later joined a team of women who programmed ENIAC. And it was the first successful general purpose programmable electronic computer. And in 1946, she went on to lead the team that uh, turned the ENIAC into the world's first successful stored program computer. Her perseverance paid off. She worked on the earliest computer pioneers and she helped launch the commercial computer industry. Some of you might have been to the Smithsonian where they have some exhibits of some of those early computers that fill up entire rooms. She was one of those who started with a computer that filled up huge rooms, and now we're down to having more computer power in our telephones than they had when they flew the capsules to the moon. It's an amazing thing. But even with her talents, she met obstacles throughout her career, and the attitudes about women's roles in the workplace. The only autobiography that has ever been written by any of the six original ENIAC programmers was hers. She tells her story, she exposes myths about the computer's origin, and uh, properly credits those who are behind the computing innovations that shape our daily lives today. That program will take place here in the Interpretive Center next month. It will be at 7 o'clock, March the 20th. So I hope many of you can come and learn about this extraordinary Missouri woman tonight. We're pleased to have a couple of friends of mine here. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Mary Muriel and Christine Montgomery uh, have gone together on a book called Merit Not Sympathy Wins, The Life of Times of Blind Boone. Uh, Blind Boone was a 19th century pianist uh, who lost his eyesight as a little boy and uh, grew up to become one of the nation's foremost pianists and this is what this book is all about. He was an illiterate Missourian who overcame a lot of obstacles in his life, including the fact that he was blinded very early in his life. He was exploited by several managers, uh, a lot of prejudice in his time, of course. He went on to become, nonetheless, one of the great and most beloved concert performers in his time. He is one of those figures in the 19th century that is largely forgotten by the large population, but he had an enormous following in his day. Blind Boone, his life and achievement is the 1915 biography that was written about him. And our two guests tonight uh, have done a lot of work with that book. They've edited it, they've added new material to it, and we're going to discover once again tonight the magic that was Blind Boone. Mary Burreal is Dr. Mary Burreal. Uh, she's a theater historian. She's been involved in some Reader's Theater projects and she's let me take part in them. We had a lot of fun doing those and it's always been a pleasure to see her. She's also done a lot of work on the Santa Fe Trail and the history of acting in 19th century America. Uh, her most recent publication is called The Haunted Boonslick Ghosts, Ghouls and Monsters of Missouri's Heartland. She lives in Boonville, right near Thespian Hall, the oldest continuously operated theater, Western Theater, West of the Alleghenies. 
Uh, Christine Montgomery is a grant writer for the University of Missouri, but I got to know her before that when she was working as a photographic specialist for the State Historical Society in Columbia. She wrote the Blind Moon essay for the Society's uh, Historic Man in Missouri's website, which I encourage you to take a look at sometime, not just that, but that whole website. She also served as contributing writer and editor for Images of Our Lives, which was a history of Columbia uh, in the 20th century. So please join me in welcoming our two guests tonight to tell us all about Blind Moon. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? This is more technology I'm wearing right now than I really know what to do with, so bear with me. Um, Mary and I are really happy to be here tonight to talk about two people that we find pretty fascinating, and I think you will too. I say too, even though the book says Blind Boone, this is really about Blind Boone and his manager, John Lang. Uh, these were uh, some incredible people that, that, as Bob said, overcame enormous obstacles, uh, principally being black in Missouri in the late 19th century and trying to make a living and, and survive to become really nationally famous, both in their own right. Um, Blind Boone was famous as a musician, and his manager, John Lang, was really uh, considered one of the best entertainment managers of the 19th and 20th century, black or white. So the, we thought, when we were doing the book, we thought we really had to give them both equal weight, because uh, in all, Honestly, I don't think one would have made it without the other. This was a really um, beneficial, synergistic relationship for both of them. And, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Now, the, the gentleman on the left is John Lang. The gentleman on the right there is Blind Boone. And you see him here after they would received some success in, in their lives. And, and this is how they presented themselves to the world in an era when a lot of black entertainers had to play the stereotype. And they always dressed well, presented themselves well, and, and really tried to to avoid doing anything like that. Let's see if I can run my first or my second. Uh, <laughs> no, I hit too far. Okay. Blind Boone uh, was the son of a, a slave who was self-emancipated or, or freed by the Union Army. He was born in a Union Army camp in 1864 in Miami, Missouri. <coughs> And within six months of his life, um, they they moved to Warrensburg, and um, in in that process, he contracted what it was probably meningitis, and, and lost his vision. Um, they, they referred to it in, in the fuel book as brain fever. I think I'm sorry. I think we missed a slide. <laughs> Again, this is. Okay, yeah, and I, and I have to really um, acknowledge everybody that was involved in the book. As Bob mentioned, this, this was a, a reissuing of the Melissa Fuel book, and we annotated it, but we also added different chapters uh, that, that Fuel didn't cover. Her work was published in 1915 and, and revised in 1918, and Boone went on to, to perform and, and he, until he died pretty much in 1927. And so we've added some chapters. We have a wonderful foreword uh, from Max Murad where he looks at, at John Boone in comparison to the life of Scott Joplin, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. John Davis, a musicologist and, and Juilliard trained musician uh, who has issued a, a CD of, of Blind Boone's music and hopefully <laughs> my third technology uh, challenge goes well then we'll hear a little bit about uh, from John about uh, Boone's music later. He wrote a book placing John's or placing Blind Boone's work in context of what was going on in the music world at that time. And Mary and Marilyn Hillsman wrote a, a, an essay on um, Melissa Fuel, the author of the biography. 
uh, who's a fascinating person in, in her own right. Mary will tell us a little bit about Melissa Fuel later. And Greg Olson, who's here in the audience tonight and also is uh, here at the State Archives, was Gary Kramer wrote a chapter on what it was like to be, what Missouri was like during the time of Blind Boom. And Mike Shaw and I did an essay at the end of the book that talks about what happened to Boone's life after um, the, the book ends. I'm sorry, roll that back and forth. Let's see if I can get it under control here. Okay, as I said, he was born in the Union Army camp. His mother was the Army cook. Um, we do, throughout Fuel's book, they talk about how Boone's father was a bugler in the 7th Militia at this Army camp, but he's never mentioned, his name is never mentioned. And so uh, Mike Shaw was able to do some research and found out that there was only one bugler at, in that particular um, army camp at that time, and his name was William Belcher. He was a 19-year-old farmer from Princeton, Missouri. So he, he was white. We're pretty sure that that was probably uh, Boone's father. I think one of the telling uh, instances is because Belcher was five foot tall and Boone was five foot tall, <laughs> and, and uh, he was uh, he was a musician. Boone was a musician. And just the, um, through some of the documents that Mike Shaw relates to in the book, it seems pretty apparent that, that this was Boone's father. There's, there's, like I said, no mention of him in the book, so we don't know if they, if Boone was aware of his father's name, if they'd ever met, or what that situation was. Um, but Boone, even as a very young child, demonstrated musical ability. He could play back anything he heard one time. And he spent a lot of time alone. His mother worked as a, a cook and a washwoman in, in Warrensburg. And just because of the economic situation and the, the cultural situation at the time, he was often left alone. And, and so they, sometimes they'd give him a, a pot to bang on and something, and they, they just discovered that he had this natural musical ability. Um, Mary, you can jump in any time. <laughs> One of the interesting things is later in life, uh, Boone was quite famous for his performances. He would sell out houses. He was performing in Kansas City. And so it's interesting to me, Belcher was in a, uh, a veteran's home in Kansas City. And Boone did play at several of them. And I've often wondered, did the father and the son cross paths and not know it? That's one of those wonderful mysteries about his life. We don't know. Um, as, as Boone got a little older, um, he would have his own tin whistle bands. You can see that's an illustration right out of the field book there. And they would play in town, and, and they were very popular. And a lot of people, um, from, from what we gather in a lot of our research, a lot of people really admired his mother, Rachel, and had a great deal of fondness for Boone. And when it came time for him to go to school, there was something of a problem because he couldn't go to the local black school. They, they had no capacity, even the local white school had no capacity for, for teaching a, a white or a black child. So, so at the age of, I think nine, they, they put him on the train for St. Louis and sent him to the Missouri School for the Blind. And so this is uh, his mother. You know, I always think myself how, how traumatic it must have been to put a, a child who's you know only nine to begin with and then a blind child on a train and send him off across the state to another town. I think that would be that would be really traumatic. But um, Rachel was one that never let anything stop her son. And, and education, of course, was just crucial. Oh, sorry. It's a trigger, a trigger, hair trigger thing here. So um, things worked out really well for him at the School for the Blind. Uh, they, what, their main purpose, of course, was to provide blind people with a trade so they, they could be self-supporting. And they tried um, getting Boone interested in schoolwork and in making rooms, and he didn't really care about any of that stuff. 
what he wanted to do was play the piano. And he was lucky enough to meet an older student named Enoch Donnelly uh, at the school. And, and Donnelly was kind enough and gracious enough to give up some of his allotted piano time to teach Boone how to play piano. Because he noticed Boone's sincerity and wanting to learn and the fact that he had some talent. So, so he, he, Boone always credited Enoch Donnelly with really being his first teacher. And Donnelly himself, I think at the time, was only 15 or 16. And unfortunately, did not live a long life. Um, but they were able to meet later in life after Boone had achieved some fame, which was really good. And, and he uh, went to the, the director of the School for the Blind and said, you know, you've, you've got to hear this kid play piano. And then the director would have him play at, at various benefits for the school. Boom. And that really went well until that director left, and the one that came in wasn't that interested in having the black students play the piano. And Boone had less piano time. And so he started to skip school. And the school was near Chestnut Valley. And Mary, maybe you could talk a little bit about Chestnut Valley. Um, who knows where Chestnut Valley was, or in what St. it was in St. Louis? It was a rough neighborhood. It was a neighborhood of um, black performers and taverns and houses of ill repute. And this was also the place that had some of the best music America was coming up with. Um, it, St. Louis was at the point where music was coming up from New Orleans, where you were getting the rhythms of the African traditions, the Louis um, Muro Gottschalk, who was a composer who used African rhythms and traditions in his music. Um, this music was heading north. We were starting to know it. Later on, we would know part of it as jazz. And what was coming in from Texas by a railroad, um, a line that went from Texas to St. Louis, were the turpentine workers, very often African-American, and also people who had a tradition of their own music, with banjo, with guitar, with what we have come to know as syncopation. This is what Boone was, when he went to Chestnut Valley, uh, he would disappear there for several days. I would imagine he was staying with friends in the area, and Lord only knows, you know, what their businesses were. But this is where he heard the music that was starting to roil up, that was going to um, end the waltz and the polka as popular music. This was the music that had rhythm, that had syncopation, that had different tones and different chords that hadn't been heard before. Boone was hearing all of this. He had an amazing capability to hear something once and recreate it. Uh, probably as a child, that's where later on he would recreate bird songs. Um, so in Chestnut Valley, this is what he was hearing, and this became part of his music later on. And as educational as it was, the, the School for the Blind didn't really think it was going to fit into their curriculum. And so eventually, for all his skipping, um, Boone was expelled. And he was so ashamed that he didn't go home for a while and just wandered around Chestnut Valley until um, until things, his situation got pretty dire. And luckily, throughout his life, there were people that took advantage of him, but there were also people that, that extended kindness to him. And, and one of the train conductors in St. Louis, uh, he was able to turn to him and the guy put him on a train and sent him home to his mom. And, um, it, has anyone ever seen the film Pretty Baby? Right, it was with Brooke Shields and it was very scandalous for its time. If you want to know what and where Boone was hanging out, the type of people he was around, the type of situations he was in, and the music he was hearing, watch that film. It's pretty darn good with the right time. So after he arrived home, he, he began playing for crowds again in the streets and all. And he would, he would do this to make money to help support his mother. That was one thing he he was ardent about his entire life, was trying to help his mother. And uh, one day, a man named Mark Cromwell happened to hear him play, and he told Boone that he could make him famous, and, and, but he had to leave town, he had to leave Wisdom, and, and do it now, and, and Boone said, I have to tell my mom, he said, no, just come with me now, and of course, this is a story we hear about all, 
all too often. And um, when he he went with Cromwell, Cromwell really um, took, you know, Boone would play the music and get the money, but then Cromwell kept all the money and, and pretty much held Boone a, a captive, wouldn't let him go home, wouldn't put him on a train. Um, and they even, they even came to Columbia. There's a famous story about how Cromwell uh, bet with Boone on a poker, poker game and, and lost him to a bartender named Sam Reeder up in Columbia. And, and so um, he has lots of interesting tales that, that we look in, into the book. And, and when um, Cromwell took off with Boone, his mom sent her husband, uh, she had married by that time and, and actually had other children, sent her husband looking for Boone. And he ran across him with, with Cromwell and was able to bring him back home. Um, Cromwell is, the, the book's full of really interesting characters and Cromwell's certainly one of them. Uh, he, his real name was actually John Durham and he ran away as a child and joined the circus <laughs> Truly, and and came under the the uh, care, if you were, of a of a man who had him, him change his name, and and so uh, he after the incident with Boone, he went on to be a newspaper editor in Kansas City. Uh, I think he held public office there, and and his view of it always was that he was the one that brought Boone out into the public. And of course, nowadays that's not how we look at it. But <laughs> and then after uh, he continued, Boone continued playing around for a while. Sometimes he would play on the trains. He would board the trains and and play music for people while they were traveling, and they, they'd pay him. But. Eventually, there were a lot of people that started copying that that weren't blind, and so Boone kept getting kicked off the train because people thought that he wasn't blind. And um, what he did eventually was start playing for churches, and through that was able to meet John Lang in Columbia. John Lang was a successful contractor. He was a road builder um, and had a place called uh, Lang Hall up in Columbia. And in December of 1879, he had his pastor go to, um, I think it was Fayette, to get Boone and bring him to play for their Christmas concert. And that went over really well. It was very successful. Uh, the Second Baptist Church that Lang was a member of hosted the, the Christmas concert. And then um, Boone and Lang just kind of hit it off and Lang felt sorry for him. And so Boone ended up hanging around. And eventually, despite the advice of most of his friends, John Lang started thinking that perhaps he could be of assistance to Boone and also himself by, by managing Boone's career. And so, do you want to talk about the Tom Wiggins? Yes. Yeah. Um, Blind Tom Wiggins, um, or as he's preferred to be known as Thomas Wiggins, was uh, a, probably what we would call today a savant, or um, may have suffered from autism. Uh, he was portrayed as someone who had no social skills, who couldn't read, couldn't write, um, would mumble to himself, and was a genius at the piano. Um, Later on in life, uh, there seemed to be some hints that some of what Tom did uh, had nothing, was really an act um, or a, some kind of emotional response that he certainly later in life uh, lived on his own and is actually buried in Brooklyn, which is fascinating to me. Um, Tom Wiggins was um, mentioned by Mark Twain in one of his newspaper articles. And of course, Twain could be incredibly kind sometimes and very vicious others, and this essay is one of his more vicious ones. Um, after he puts down Tom for any number of reasons, though, he comments that he played like an angel. Uh, there were a number of blind players, uh, piano players, who traveled the country um, at that time. Whether they were blind or not, I don't know, but Wiggins was remembered as being uh, his music is incredible. It's very difficult to play. It's not something an average musician could even touch. I don't care how long you study. Um, Wiggins would travel and 
do performances. He ended up in Columbia, and what they did was they put, what Wiggins would do is at the end of the show, he would say, anyone can come up and play something, and I'll reproduce that playing on one, you know, one hearing. So Lang sent Boone up, and Boone was able to match him song for song, and eventually, according to the record, beat him. And Blind Tom Wiggins was never seen in Columbia again. That's the Columbia version. That's the Columbia version, yes. Um, but there's no doubt that Boone was influenced by his musicianship. Uh, it's technically remarkable if you hear any of the songs. Again, John Davis, I think, did some Tom Wiggins songs. Mm -hmm. And they are very they often use things like putting your whole arm down on the piano and whistling and tapping and making sounds at the same time as you're performing. Um, Boone could play a song in, on his, with his left hand in one key, with his right hand in another key, and whistle a third in the third key. So this is the level of technical expertise we saw in these two men. So after Wiggins was bested by Blind Boone, who at this time was 15 years old, um, Lang decided to be his manager and, and he wrote to Rachel and said, I'll send you $10 a month whether we make it or not. And when, when um, Blind Boone becomes 21, he'll become a partner in the company. And he did that. He kept his word, unlike many before him uh, who did not. And so they started traveling around, playing the summer fairs and everything. And they, you know, they were doing all right, but not really. Um, they were, it was a struggle. They were having a hard time surviving their stories of, of Lang selling his galoshes to, to get money to, to keep going. And this was a time when it, it you know, um, traveling with money was dangerous and, and getting money from home was, was a lot more arduous. So there's, there's a, a lot of difficulty there. And then in April, 1880, uh, there was a horrific tornado in, in Marshfield, Missouri, and a good portion of the town uh, was damaged, and a lot of, uh, like 100 people died. And the story is that John Lang was reading the newspaper to Blind John, <laughs> that's what Boone was known as at the time, was Blind John. And, and while Boone was playing on the piano, and out of that grew his, his music known as the Marshfield Tornado, that was said to be so realistic that when he went to play it in Marshfield as his opening number, people thought that the tornado was coming and ran out of the building and didn't come back. And so after that, he always played it last. <laughs> And Boonby was a small man, but a powerful man. I mean, five foot was relatively small, short even in those days. But he had an incredible power on the piano. And I don't know, how many did he go through? 30 in his? Well, I know when, when um, Melissa Fuel wrote the book, they said he, he owned a good number of pianos and I think had gone through several pianos, just, and, and the ones that he had built special for him were reinforced. Yeah, there is, you can visit the piano in uh, Columbia at the, the Boone County Historical Society. And if you're really fast and don't pay any attention to the guards, you can plunk it. Because <laughs> I needed to do that. I know, I know, but you know, it's fun. Um, I know, it's, but you have to do that sometimes. You touch history, but you do that. He was a piano. And I touched it. The piano has a wonderful story. It was, uh, after Boone died, it ended up at one of the schools in Columbia, and then Columbia was going to raise some money for headstones. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's a fun story. And um, they didn't make enough money for the fundraising thing, so the gentleman who ran it took the piano as payment, and the piano went to Springfield or Joplin, I can't remember where it was used at like the Knights of Columbus. I'm, not, I'm really not sure of the exact uh, place. Um, eventually it was rediscovered, returned, repaired, and you can, in fact, enjoy um, a lot of visiting artists who do perform on it. It's an amazing sounding um, instrument. And it's beautiful. We got a picture of it later we can show you. So, so they're kicking around and it's kind of difficult making ends meet, but in 1882, um, 
Lang hired B.T. Razor, who was actually a sheriff in southwest Iowa at the time, Civil War vet. And it's never mentioned in the book, but Razor was, had only had one arm. He was in the Civil War. And when we were researching this book, um, <laughs> I googled his name and up popped in eBay his spork, which is the, the fork spoon, com fork knife combination that, that the one-armed vets used after the Civil War. And of course, I think it made a comeback in what, 1970s or something for a period of time. But, but uh, Razor, although his background was the Civil War, being a sheriff, was really a great entrepreneur. And he uh, also had some connections and was able to send Boone to uh, a, a, a woman who taught piano in Iowa, Iowa City. In, <laughs> Iowa City. <laughs> Um, so, so Boone spent the summer with her, and she she taught him classical music, and that was really a turning point in in Boone's career and, and in the company. Um, and um, along with along with that, they acquired Ed the Parrot, who, who <laughs> was a gift that they gave to his wife, and they would walk through the town the day of a performance, and of course all the kids would run around and want to see Ed the Parrot, and, and um, they would say, well, you know, come to the performance tonight. And so all the kids then would run home and say to their folks, we gotta go, we gotta go, there's a parrot he's gonna sing. And then, of course, Ed didn't really make an appearance during the course of the concert, and afterwards sometimes the parent would come up and complain, and. And, and they'd say, oh, Ed was tired. <laughs> and Ed eventually got John Lang into um, a really... He was a talking parrot. Yeah, he was a talking parrot. Uh, he went everywhere. And uh, I guess at one point there were some workmen in one of the theaters setting it up for the show, and John Lang was there, and Ed the parrot cursed at one of the workmen. And the workman turned around and threatened John Lang and said, don't you dare call me that. And John Lang was like, I'd say, and he turned his back again and Ed cursed. And the guy went after John. So there was, Ed, Ed was retired to Kansas yeah. City to live a long and quiet life. <laughs> Ed deserves a biography. So it was around 1882 that they started calling the company the Blind Boom. A touring company, and they had other people with them quite often. Uh, for a while, it was Lang's wife, Ruth. She was the secretary, and um, Boone married Lang's youngest sister, Eugenia, in 1889, and she was the treasurer, and often there would be a female vocalist. Sometimes the vocalists would pick up some of those duties as well. Occasionally there were other musicians that traveled with them, but uh, they became the Blind Moon Company at that point. And um, initially, Lang had white business partners, but that didn't work out really well. He had uh, Razor, I believe, was his last white advanced man. And what that, that was really uh, crucial in the early days when they weren't well known because the advanced man would go into a community before the, the company and he would try to get them um, gigs, basically. And of course, this was an era where there was a lot of uncertainty about people you didn't know and, you know, a black company, that was something else again. And so there would be a lot of hesitation about hiring a company, but if, the, if it was a white advanced man, then it was like, that was okay. And one of the things that was very sad for that era is when they would travel, they would get an agreement from a hotel, you know, they'd wire ahead, they were the blind boom company, and they would, yes, they'd have a room, and of course when they got there, they were denied the room. This happened many times. They would end up either trying to find someone in the black community to take them in. They would sleep in on the trains or in the railway um, station. So what they went through, even when they were very, very well known, is pretty pathetic. <coughs> so in 1910, um, by that time, They'd become very well known. They were able to travel around the, the region, the Midwest, and, and 
food tour from September to the end of June it usually was and, and play continually and come home with lots of money in the pockets. And of course Columbia just loved them again and um, for various reasons. You know, it, the, the other thing that Boone and Lang often did was um, perform in churches and they would give the church a cut of the performance and so the, a lot of the local churches were able to survive that way. And so when he would come back into town, there was an article in the paper about Boone is back in town, but he's asking, please only come Wednesday morning because he's very tired and he needs to rest. And I think that, you know, he was the, the one everybody wanted to go see. And he was, he, he opened up his house and, and you know, um, a lot of, of the notable white community of Columbia would come to his house. And Boone loved children. They didn't have any children. Um, so the kids would hang around him and they would lead him places and one of the things he would do is he would always put a child on his shoulder and you would see him downtown Columbia with the child going left, right, straight ahead. And the joke was that every time the, the children were around him and one was guiding him, he would do all his chores and then the, the uh, boy or go, girl would direct him to the candy store. <laughs> So that had been the, the rule, the tradition was to have a white partner or a white advance man. But once they achieved a certain level of stability, Lang became, hired his first black advance agent, who was A.O. Coffin. And at this time, um, Lang was a good 20, 25 years older than Boone. And I think by this time he knew that, that his health was going and he was hoping that Coffin would be his successor, that if something happened to him, that Coffin would take over and, and be able to continue with Boone. Uh, and then, Mary, you want to talk about the QRS piano rolls? Oh, well, we can have Bob Pretty come up and That's talk right. about the QRS piano rolls. <laughs> uh, Boone recorded with the QRS company, which is still in Buffalo and still making piano rolls. Um, at that time, I don't, they were punched directly, the performer would play and the machine would punch as he or she played. The problem with Boone, he only did, well, we're arguing, but we're guessing about, I'm going with your number, probably about nine or ten recordings. Um, the story is with a couple of them that didn't last, is he played so fast and so heavy that the machine couldn't keep up with him. They tried recording Marshville Tornado, but there were so many notes. The story is that the, the machine jammed up. And we, we don't have So there's music. no recording. Yeah. Yeah, and no music for that either. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things was, um, by this time, a lot of Boone's compositions were being published. And so, of course, he couldn't do musical notation. So what he would do is um, hire local pianists to come in and they'd have to watch him play and then note the music and then they would play and he would correct their playing. And so this was a rather long process, but that, that was how he was able to get his compositions published. Anything from the QRS? Um, I think Dixie. Okay, well, <laughs> um, the problem with playing, you, you may, we'll, you'll hear something on one of the uh, QRS rolls in a little bit. The problem with that is it doesn't capture, well we could do it now, um, it didn't capture the way a performer played. You could only get so much in the way of dynamics, and so much in the way of, of um, a suggestion of emotion and also it's a little bit sort of mechanical. Yeah, and I think you really notice it in the speed of the song, that it's not always probably as, as fluid, but I think it's this first one. This will be our test drive. Or I can comment. Does it... <laughs> did we unplug something? Yes, but... <laughs> it's Dixie. Um, well, you fiddle with that. I want to go on that. <laughs> Sounds great up here. Oh, the volume button. <laughs> this was interesting. Um, there were a few concessions that, that Boone made to kind of the stereotypes of the time. But oddly enough, um, I gotta stop this at some point. Mary, yeah, can you stop this? Me, you're asking. 
Uh, one of the things that he would do is occasionally during a concert he would play Dixie. And um, I think primarily this, this was a, a method of of sort of making sure the audience would get behind him because it, it was very dangerous. We're talking the Jim Crow era where, where there's lynchings and, and a lot of violence going on toward, toward blacks and, and here are these people that are traveling from town to town so it's not like they have a base of friends surrounding them and, and keeping them safe. So one of the things that they would do is, uh, they were also Masons, which I think was a good political move because whatever town they were in, they would they would find the highest ranking Mason and, and make sure they knew that they were in town. And um, I think playing Dixie was a, a way of, of not Let's see, how would I say this? Not, not promoting themselves too much above their station. I think we would say today above their station. Another thing, uh, although the one thing they did was they always dressed well, there were some traveling black musicians and singers that uh, the code was to never dress better than your audience because that would be a, a kind of a dangerous thing. Um, so this is one of the programs that, that the Boone Company put out. And you can see up here, we travel on our merit, not our sympathy. And that's a direct uh, reference to Blind Tom. Did you want to talk about that, Mary? Or? Okay. Well, what I wanted to say was at the concerts, uh, you would hear a lot of music. Uh, looking at some of the programs, most of the programs we have of their performances are from a series of performances he gave in Chicago. And when you look at them, it goes from classical music and Liszt and Schumann and, and uh, uh, Beethoven. Uh, and then you'll see some spirituals. You may see something like Dixie. And then you'll see um, the unfortunately named coon songs from that era, which were very often negative stereotypes uh, set to almost a ragtime or a jazzy kind of a beat about yeah. the African American community. We've got some examples of that a little later on. We don't we don't have a recording because that's something he didn't record, but we do have some of his compositions. But that he, were he, I mean, he played for both black and white audiences. Of course, they were in separate um, separate performances. Uh, but he did what he called putting the cookies on the bottom shelf. He wanted to make sure that his audiences heard music that they could all identify with. He didn't consider, he considered himself a classical performer and a classical musician, not a ragtime musician. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, he did want to please his audiences. And he did so by bringing in music that today we find extremely offensive. Unfortunately, in the late 19th century, was quite acceptable. OK, and here you can see Boone in the center and Lang. And Emma Smith, their, their soprano at the time. Here's Ruth Lang, John's wife, who was still traveling with the company, and Eugenia, Boone's wife, who was the treasurer. And Josephine Huggard, who was actually, uh, I think, Lang's niece, was traveling and was an accompanist. And they, what's interesting here, they say, bring the children, they will be benefited. And, and um, Boone has been the means of a great many children falling in love with the piano. And then down below, they give a description. Boone will be 39 years old next May, weighs, does that say 365 pounds? I was thinking, or is it 265 pounds? Looks like um, um, <laughs> which at the time, you know, nowadays we think, oh my God, he was so unhealthy. But at the time, uh, 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 girth <laughs> was considered rather robust and helpful. Healthful. And in a time, we have to consider like Emma Smith up there, the soprano died of tuberculosis. And this was the era of the wasting disease where it wasn't uncommon for somebody to be initiated through tuberculosis. And did you think Elvis had, had issues with um, imitators? Boone had the same thing. The reason they just, he would describe himself mm -hmm. is so that in a town where a guy said, I'm blind Boone, I'm going to do a performance tonight, and he walked in, he was 5'8 and 125 pounds, they knew right away, not blind Boone. <laughs> Um, the, their motto, we travel on our merit, not sympathy, is a reference to Tom Wiggins, who was really <coughs> touted as something of an imbecile despite his musical ability. 
and relied a lot on audience sympathy, and that was one one image that they wanted to negate. That that you know Boone uh, wasn't autistic, and and was you know had his his senses, and and that he traveled you know not to enjoy him out of sympathy, but because he was good at what he did. Okay, this is Melissa Peel. Yeah. Um, Boone had a tradition of usually having young singers. Um, in fact, I think Stella May was maybe seven or eight when she joined the company. And then they would grow up in the company. Uh, they would do spirituals, they would do classical music. Um, one of the, uh, was it Emma Smith who died? Yeah. Of, of quite young and uh, I just tracked down her grave, which is outside of Kansas City, and uh, would like to visit it eventually. These were very, very talented women. I mean, certainly professional level opera stars. Um, and they were very well known, and almost every review talks about how gracious and lovely and brilliant they were. Uh, one of the women, Melissa Fuel, joined again. She was born in Warrensburg, New York, so it's a Probably her family, I mean, I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, 13 years and I'm still not here yet. Um, but uh, she, uh, probably, the families probably knew each other, um, her family, the Fuels and uh, the Booms. Uh, she is an amazing, she deserves her own biography and I really mean that. Uh, she put herself through, she sang with Boone uh, for a number of years when his wife uh, chose not to travel for whatever reason. Um, Melissa, in addition to singing, also did all the correspondence, took care of all the clothing and all the repairs. I mean, she was all of maybe 17 years old, 16 years old when she was doing this. She went to Lincoln University which I think was amazing, came out as a teacher. And she left in an interview later in her life, she said that she put herself through Lincoln University, Lincoln Institute at that time, by scrubbing the wooden floors on her hands and knees because they didn't believe in mops. She came back to Boone and uh, worked with him for a while. She had gone out to Colorado, didn't like teaching, came back here to Columbia, or to Columbia, and eventually sang a little bit with him. And Lang asked her to write a biography of Boone which she did, and it, uh, which is actually what we have in the book. Um, she, she interviewed people, she got um, comments from people who knew Boone, who grew up with Boone. She did a wonderful job. After that, she married um, Mr. Cuther, and they went, his name was Sunshine Cuther, he was working in um, Sedalia at some of the hotels. They moved to Joplin and s started a hotel for black um, musicians and performers because still when you went to a town there was no guarantee you were going to have a place to stay so Melissa decided to start a hotel and take care of that problem at the same time she was also very very influential in saving the George Washington Carver home in fact I don't think too many people know she started the first black Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops in Missouri she founded several schools out towards the Kansas City area and here's a, you know, a woman who we know nothing about, and yet she was both artistically, politically, socially um, a leader in this state. So she took on the uh, writing the biography, uh, was published twice. Uh, they thought it would make some money, it certainly didn't. And today, if you ever come across an original copy, uh, consider yourself very, very fortunate. They're extremely rare. Okay, we'll try some more music here. The first one is uh, one of Boone's classical swan pieces that he wrote, had published in 1888 called Woodland Murmurs. Yeah, Boone loved to... Um, oh, no, that's not Woodland Murmurs. <laughs> well, that's actually fun. I don't know what it is. There we go. Painting was very popular in the late 18th, uh, late 19th century. We'll just play some short bits of this here. And this is what Boone was known for. And in a few seconds, you'll hear what we know Boone for. Okay, and this is Last Dream Waltz from 1909. Hopefully. 
when they sold sheet music, they usually made maybe a penny a, a piece of, of music. So, of course, the very popular performers would make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And somebody like Boom maybe made a thousand dollars a year on the sheet music that was sold. It wasn't peanuts in those days, but it certainly wasn't what the superstars were doing. I think we'll move on. <laughs> Scott Joplin made a lot of money. Let's put it in context. Uh, here's the red. Okay. These two red medleys introduced a couple of things to music uh, that we're so familiar with we don't give it a second thought. Again, the syncopation. And every who's, where are my musicians? The walking bass. You'll hear the walking bass. The stride bass. The stride bass and the walking bass. Let's see if I can... Ragtime was popular music, but it wasn't nice music. Day, who was 
was a construction manager in, in Kansas City, became their manager. And he was very good. He got them a tour to the East Coast, so they traveled to, to Ohio and New York and, and I think went to Baltimore. And, and um, they, they were doing well, but it was, it was taking a toll. One of the interesting things about Boone, everybody's heard of Diamond Jim Brady, right? Because of all the diamonds he wore. Well, actually, it was Boone who started the idea of bling, bling. with a performer. Um, he loved to wear his medals and uh, his honors. Uh, you can, again, see some of these um, items at the Boone County Historical Society. But it was a mark of success. It was also, in these days, it was a way that an entertainer could take uh, something, carry something with him that wasn't cash that could be transferred into cash should the need arise. And, the, and another story was that when Lang died, um, later on you'll see that Boone uh, was near bankruptcy and died with very little money. And one of the thoughts is that he spent so much money on Lang's funeral. Yeah. And then Boone himself gave uh, his final performance in May 1927 and died in October of that year. Um, his wife Eugenia followed him in 1931. And uh, the graves were unmarked for a long time until Mary was, was talking about the, the fundraising that went on at um, with the piano. Yeah, the piano. Um, one of the for the, the real music historians out here, who knows U.B. Blake? Who's heard of U.B. Blake? The really sad thing, U.B. Blake was supposed to do the arrangements for this 1971 event, and there were letters saying that he was suffering so badly from arthritis he just didn't feel he could complete it. What a loss that was. There, in the U.B. Blake papers in Baltimore, there's a photo of him, and U.B. Blake had written on it, world's best piano player. And here's the Boone House in Columbia. Um, many of you probably know they're restoring it. This is when Boone owned it. I don't know if you can see. He's sitting on the porch, and there's lots of children. And then this gentleman over here is John Lang. And they're in the process of, of restoring the home today. And actually, Greg Olson, who's in our audience now, is also on the Blind Boone uh, Foundation Board in Columbia, and part of that effort. And this is the piano. This is the, the pian Boone uh, inside the home with his piano. This is the piano that's down at, at the Boone County, and you can see it here down at the Boone County Historical Society. Now it's a beautiful, beautiful piano. Chicory. And we'd like to let you know that if you buy the book, all the sales proceeds go to the restoration of the house. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Is, is the house open for tours yet? Not yet. It's still, um, the outside's been done, but the inside is all, um, got, I don't, yeah, I got it. Essentially got it. Did he tour with that piano, or was that the piano that he had in his home? He had a small chicory that he took on tour with him. Okay, so he did he get around in different places? And Occasionally they did. And, and in the early days, they put a piano on the back of a wagon and hauled it from town to town. And in fact, one of Boone's songs, I think it's the Whippoorwill, um, he rode after the wagon had broken down and Boone took the horse and went to town and left Blind Boone alone overnight out in the middle of nowhere with the wagon. So it was, it was a difficult life. Was there another question? Oh, yeah. How did he acquire the name Boone? Well, that's an interesting story, and again, one where we haven't parsed everything out. Uh, Rachel went by the name Rachel Boone, and we uh, feel that, that the, the people that served as her masters, or, uh, um, that she was somehow, they were somehow connected to the Boone family, but we haven't quite figured it out. Um, her death certificate gave her name as Rachel Carpenter, which wasn't any of her married names, and uh, there is a... Uh, an arm of the Boone family that, that had the name Carpenter. So, and, I, and I think they were in Benton County, which is where we're pretty sure she was from. Mm -hmm. Where was he born, actually? You gave he was born in Miami, Missouri, at, oh, okay. the, at the Union Army Camp there. Yeah. It's pretty close to where Mark Twain was born. Mark Twain was born in Florida. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. In one section of 
Columbia is his home, north, east, south, or west? It's in central Columbia. Just uh, if you're in downtown Columbia, if you go to the Second Baptist Church, which is right on Broadway, it's directly behind that. And within the Second Baptist Church, there's a beautiful stained glass window dedicated to John Lane Sr., the father of, of Boone's manager. Yeah. You said if I, if, that at birth, six months old, he had brain fever. They referred to it in the book as brain fever. And that is the contributing factor to the loss of sight? Yeah, um, actually, I think it, it's the treatment of it more than, than the, the disease. They, uh, it was probably meningitis. They thought of it as like pressure on the brain. And so I had actually my daughter's pediatrician told me about this. They would inject a needle into the eye to relieve the pressure and that would cause the, the eyeball to atrophy. And the school records for the Missouri School for the Blind say that that it was ocular atrophy. That's the cause of his blindness. So there's it, uh, in the field book they say that the surgeon, the army surgeon who who treated him, took removed his eyes. But and people fight to the death to say that that's what happened. So. <laughs> okay. But really, what I want to know is within those first six months yeah. before the brain fever. What was his name? Well, I think John William Boone yeah. was his name. Little I'm little sorry, Johnny. we didn't say that in the beginning. I am sorry. Little Johnny is John one of his nicknames. Um, he was also called Willie. In Warrensburg, he went by Willie. Um, at, at Johnny at the School for the Blind. So. And by all accounts, despite the blindness, he was... He had a lot of friends. He played baseball. Um, the kids would play, you know, tricks on him, and he was very much part of the community. Um, so this was not a child who sat in a corner somewhere, as so many at that time did if they were blind. He was out and about. Did you? Do you know where Chestnut Valley was in St. Louis? It was actually the school for the blind was near there. The original school for the blind. Do you know the I can't remember the street parameters. No. Um, but in that central downtown area, close to the river, that's yeah. all. Like, was, was I'm trying to remember if we had Tom a map. Uh, Tom Turpin. Oh, Rosebud Cafe. Yeah. Oh, Rosebud oh, right. Cafe. Oh. That, was that came later. later. That, was, right. that was the end of it. The same so. area. Though. Yeah. I see. Quite often that area of town, in, in, uh, like the... Uh, in San Francisco, they call it the Tenderloin District, and that, that's kind of the common name for it. Which, if that gives you an idea of what was going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Were there many difficulties or problems getting into the school in St. Louis? No, the, the county, the county um, really paid its way. And, and there was a group of women that, that made clothes for him to send him off. And, and His mother worked for the Cockrell family. Uh, Senator Cockrell had also been very, sorry, Senator Cockrell had always, I just used to, had always been very, um, he was in the Civil War on the Southern side, but he uh, really loved Rachel Boone, and he made the way for a uh, my John. Heart, we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the townspeople did. Yes, they just, you know, so he helped get him into the Institute. And he was... Um, in the legislature at the time, and they were responsible for funding of the the school for the blind. So he he was a well connected individual. He even went there on some legislative visit and been, was able to play for him. Yeah, was, was there involvement with the theater owners voting association? Where if not, how would they keep separate from those? Because they really had a corner on that African American market. Set. I, you know, that would have been some of the larger theaters, the more formalized theaters. Boone played in those, so I honestly don't know. I'm assuming his advancement or his or John Lang knew how to get into the, you know, get booked for that. Um, but he also played in many small churches. Uh, he played for many private organizations or um, fraternal organizations, and they wouldn't have needed to go through the association to get those bookings. 
One really interesting story, and I'll try to tell it quickly, was that one of their one of their um, advanced agents was J. Shannon White, who was the grandson of James Shannon, president of the University of Missouri, who owned John Lang's mother, and so in effect owned John Lang when he was growing up, um, but then later on worked for Lang and became a, a touring booking agent himself. Have you ever heard the story where uh, J.D. Blondin was um, won in a poker game? Yeah, yeah, with, that was, I probably wasn't very clear when I was talking about it earlier. That was where Cromwell lost him in a poker game and to Samuel Reeder, the, the barkeep of the Columbia. There was, uh, he, Reeder knew that Cromwell wanted him back, so he hid, he hid Boone away and for like three days, kept him in a room, and then, well, the, the, and this is the story again, when they, when he, the first time he got out, Cromwell came by and picked him up and they took off, because life was definitely better with Cromwell traveling around than being locked up in a room. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Christine. Thank you very much. This was a fascinating story, and of course, you can learn more about Blind Boone by buying the book. And, and again, to remind you, the proceeds from the book go to the Blind Boone Home Restoration Project in Columbia. And uh, you know, for many years, Blind Boone was just kind of kind of part of history, but not really recognized too much in Columbia. And then it was about the time in '71 that, that they really started to rediscover Blind Boone. Does the piano work? Oh yeah. Okay. They they do play it on occasion, uh, and I believe John Davis has played that piano. Yes. So uh, come up and uh, talk to the the, the the people who've been presenting this program tonight. We thank them very much for being with us, and we thank you for being here. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Friends of the Archives and tell you that uh, this is a support group for the archives. We do a lot of good work on behalf of the archives. The Friends of the Group is the one that underwrites any expenses that go with this kind of program. And we'll have another one next month, especially on computers. If you'd like to join us and be a friend of the Missouri State Archives, we have material back on the table. I hope you take it home and uh, uh, become members. Join us. Uh, one of the benefits of membership is that every June we have an annual meeting. And we have good food and a great speaker. And John Dugan will be telling people more about that as we get closer to it. But along about June, members of the Friends of the Archives are welcome to join us for that. We have a good time with it. So keep that in mind. Join with us. It's a worthwhile project. And your membership will help to support us as we bring in more programs like this. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. We'll see you next month.